Well, my task this morning is not to report on Bible talk, you've already gotten that, but is to remind you why we are involved in mission work in the first place. That's why the sermon is entitled, Why Go? Why go? Why do mission work? Why do local outreach, personal evangelism? Why do it? Why spend the money? Why spend the time, the energy? A lot of reasons, but I've boiled it down to three. Three reasons, and we'll get into it right away. Reason number one, why we go? Well, it's a command. It's a command. In Matthew 28, 18, 19, already been read, Jesus came up and spoke to them saying, all authority, so right away, all authority has been given to me. I'm the boss, I give the commands, right? All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. So here's the command, go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. I, I want you to note the elegant simplicity as Jesus combines the three elements of what I call, what we call pattern theology in two straightforward verses. It's a thing of beauty. I mean, you know, the way it's put together. Briefly explain pattern theology is a tool that we use to determine accurately the meaning of scripture in context in a consistent manner. In other words, we, we, we approach the, the, uh, the way that we interpret scripture the very same way each time so that we can you know, uh, come to a conclusion uh, you know, consistently every time. And so we do this by observing if what is written uh, in the Bible, is it a command? Is it an example of a biblical concept or a function? Or is it an inference leading us to a logical conclusion? Asking those questions helps us determine what the passage actually means. So in these two lines uh, that in context deal with the making of disciples for Jesus, we have all three things, all three elements. First, it's a command, do this, he says. Do this, go, make disciples. That's an imperative sentence. Do this, that's the end. And then he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and Son and the Holy Spirit. That's the means. The end is make disciples. The means is by uh, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So you have a command, then you have an example. Throughout the gospels, we have examples of this process, you know, of making disciples as, uh, as first John the Baptist, then Jesus and his apostles, uh, we see them making disciples, how? Uh, by uh, baptizing repentant believers. So we have an example, you know, we don't have to ask ourselves, boy, I wonder how we should make disciples, I wonder what they ought to do. Uh, well, we have plenty of examples of what they ought to do to become uh, disciples. And then the third element, you know, necessary inference, this is when all the information that we have in the passage points to only one logical conclusion. Here, when you put the repeated examples, you know, people being baptized in order to become disciples, and the direct command, go and make disciples by baptizing them you know, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, what happens? Uh, well, you, you end up with the necessary inference or the logical conclusion that baptism leads to discipleship. No other conclusion is logical or follows the examples that we have. So, why go? Well, number one reason, Jesus commands us to make disciples. Just as he commands us to love one another, just as he commands us to forgive our enemies or have mercy on the less fortunate or to be pure sexually. You know, we're commanded to do those things. Well, mission work is a command to the church. So why do we go? Because it's a command from Jesus, that's why. Number two, why go? Well, because people are really lost. I mean, really, they're lost. I remember when I realized I had to leave everything and go preach the gospel. I remember the moment. I hadn't been a Christian for very long and I was on a noisy subway car. Exactly, maybe not this subway car, but one exactly like it because it's a picture of a subway car in, 
in Montreal and I was on a subway car. I see where the guy is, uh, I think it's a guy, yeah, a guy in the black there, he's got his arm over like this, you know. And there were two girls sitting right next to me, you know, because kind of, it's pretty cramped in those things. So like I say, I hadn't been a Christian very long and I was on a noisy subway car in Montreal and two girls sitting in front of me were talking over the noise. Uh, so I could hear their conversation quite clearly. I mean, they were right next to me. I couldn't help not hearing what they said. And they were talking about, you know, which nightclub they were going to go to that weekend. Well, which club are we going to go dance at this weekend? Yada, yada. And their boyfriends, and are they going to bring their boyfriends or are they going to go by themselves, you know? And one girl was discussing when her boyfriend of one month was going to move in with her. You know, we've been dating a month. I think it's time for him to move in, you know, and they were discussing the wisdom of that. Imagine the wisdom of that, of having that old boy move in uh, after a month. And the other girl was saying, you know, the bad luck that she had, because she had to kick her boyfriend out, you know, but she was on the hunt for another live-in uh, boyfriend. And it hit me at that moment, uh, this girl is lost. She is lost. She doesn't have a clue about what life is really about. And this is when I seriously began to think about you know, becoming a preacher. She was so far from the truth. She didn't even know what she didn't know. <laughs> you know, understand what I'm saying? She didn't know what she didn't know. She was living in this fantasy world, you know, I go to work, I go to the clubs on the weekend, I got to find a boyfriend and round and round and round. And that was it. That was the total sum of, of her existence. Uh, not so much like, uh, you know, the, uh, the rich uh, young ruler in Mark chapter 10, you know, who, who, who sought out Jesus and who he thought he knew, uh, but he didn't. He also uh, uh, came very close, uh, but he didn't have a clue. So both the girl on the subway and the young rich guy, you know, they were equally lost. Never mind the world out there is lost. We here in America, you know, a supposedly Christian country, we're lost too. And we don't even realize it. You know, the other brothers got up and talked about Ethiopia and Kenya and Zimbabwe and all these a country's far away and how the people are lost there. Never mind them. What about us here in the United States? I just said, believe me, you know, I wish I could say, oh, I did, I, I did some huge research. No way, I just took 10 random facts to prove a point. 10 signs of lostness for a supposedly Christian nation so the USA, a supposedly Christian nation, is falling behind China, an atheist nation, economically and militarily and scientifically. Uh, we're going broke, spending trillions of dollars that we don't have. Uh, America is being infested uh, by the COVID uh, pandemic. Uh, our children are being indoctrinated by a godless socialist education system. Uh, the media is confirming and promoting as normal the LGBTQ plus lifestyle. It's normal, why are you getting excited? Why, uh, why are you pushing back? This is the new normal. Recent survey found that 16% of young people between 15 and 25 identify as transgender. This used to be 0.001% of the population. Now, 16%, 60%, 60% of college graduates are women. And that's a good thing, but it is creating a generation of males who are lost when it comes to their identity and their purpose in society. We have a society that values fame, beauty, and wealth over character, integrity, and intelligence. 
In the United States, we're in the process of erasing our history and American identity as the populace accepts ideas from subversive groups like BLM and Antifa and destructive narratives like the critical race theory and the 1619 project. Are you kidding me? We're tearing down, we're tearing down statues of our presidents, the past presidents, you know, to put up statues of what? Nothing. And because of the rapid development of AI, artificial intelligence, by unscrupulous entities in the future, we're going to have to compete with machines for the right to survive. And the fastest growing trend in surveys about religion in America is the increase in percentage of people who answer none when asked the question, what religious preference do you have? The majority of people now answer none. I don't have any preference. Never mind, I'm Catholic or Protestant. None. So all of this is observational. All of this is anecdotal, but it reveals a trend and a character. Our nation is, a, is in a downward trend, not consistent with our national motto, which is in God we trust. If we're a nation that says, in God we trust, these things should not be happening in our country, but they are. We are fast becoming a non-Christian nation whose salvation is not a political party, whose salvation is not an economic theory, whose salvation is a savior. And that savior is not Donald Trump or some other politician but the author of salvation, and that is Jesus Christ. He's the savior that we need. I mentioned 10 national crises, but I could have focused on individual failings like moral failure and unfaithfulness and disobedience, as well as pride and greed and lust and all the sins that send the soul to hell. The nation is in trouble, yes, but the saving of the nation takes place one citizen at a time, one citizen at a time. So why go? Because we have the meta solution that both heals the individual of sin and transforms a society into a people who turn to God for help in times of crisis. You ask yourself, Boy, how do we turn our society around? I keep hearing people saying that, well, you know, we've gone so far. We have a, we have a, a, a transsexual, you know, men dressing as women, going into kindergartens, reading stories to little children. Why do that? Well, simply to desensitize children uh, uh, to, to, to this phenomenon. And people, older people say, well, I, I, I can't imagine how we can go back. How do we go back? You know, one of these days, uh, perhaps uh, uh, someone who's openly gay will become the president. How, how do we come back from something like that? Well, I'll tell you how we turn society around. We turn society around with revival not revolution. Revival, not revolution. Only Christ can save us as a nation. Only Christ can save us as an individual. Why go? One more reason. We need to get out there because there are way too many gospels being preached out there. The problem is not the gospel isn't being preached out there. The problem is there's way too many gospels being preached out there. Does anybody here listen to Christian radio? Anybody? Anybody listen to Christian radio? I do in the car, you know. You listen to Christian radio. Have you actually heard what is spoken from the pulpits of the largest churches in the world? Have you listened to the gospel message spoken to millions 
on television and radio and now online because we're online. I'm always checking online. You know, I'm, I'm watching what other guys are doing. I want to I wanna see what are they doing because I want to see compared to what we're doing. You know? and, I, and I listen to what they're saying. I don't have the time to describe all the variations, but I can summarize the two largest groups and what they preach as the gospel. Okay, very quickly. So we have the Roman Catholics and the gospel. Roman Catholics, of course, identify as Christians. They teach that you are born with inherited sin called original sin, which is eliminated based on the faith of your parents or your godparents who bring their babies to be baptized, sprinkled by a parish priest. And then later on, when the child is 10 or 12 years old, he or she goes through a ceremony called confirmation, where another Catholic clergyman, this time a bishop, touches the young person's you know, forehead or cheek, which they call the laying on of hands, so that the young person can now receive the Holy Spirit. So when they're babies, they're baptized based on the faith of their parents, and then when they're 12 years old, they receive the Holy Spirit based on the, the laying on of hands of a clergyman. And then attending confession and going to mass and communion at least once per year at Easter maintains your place on the church rolls. You know, you know my history and you know my dad, you know his history, he was a bookie for the mob and yet he went to mass once a year at Easter time. Of course, Catholics do many good works of charity, you know, to be fair. They operate orphanages and hospitals. They have been leaders of the pro-life movement. However, their preaching and the follow through of the gospel itself is completely unbiblical to the point that if the apostles Peter and Paul were alive today, they wouldn't even recognize it. They would be saying, what's that? What are they doing? And then we have uh, general Protestantism. This includes you know, mainline denominations as well as evangelicals and Baptists, you know, our friends across the street, charismatics. There are many differences in organization and practice between these groups, but they preach a similar message when it comes to the gospel. I know this because I listen to their different preachers and I wait for the money shot you know, at the end of their sermon is going to be the invitation to be saved. So I'm listening to see what are they saying? Basically, they're saying you're saved by faith alone. By faith alone, there's another, there's another phrase that doesn't appear in the New Testament. You won't find you're saved by faith alone anywhere in the New Testament. They also believe and teach that unless the Holy Spirit enables you to believe in Jesus, you cannot be saved. This is why their manner of preaching is to have people accept Jesus or receive Jesus through intellectual assent. In other words, I accept what has been done for me by Jesus on the cross and the Holy Spirit in my heart. I accept that. This ascent they call faith alone, which is code for you don't choose, you simply receive. Catholic gospel and the Protestant gospel are similar in one important way. They both eliminate free will in the process of salvation to a lesser or greater degree. Catholics eliminate it altogether by situating the process of salvation at birth when a child cannot yet exercise their will. This makes growing the church easy since it's based on birth rate and not evangelism. Protestants and others disregard free will teaching that the change factor is provided by the Holy Spirit. In other words, the Holy Spirit leads you to faith because without him, you could not choose Jesus for yourself. This is why baptism plays a secondary role if considered at all, because baptism, listen now carefully if you've wandered, 
because baptism is a symbol of man's will and in their system, man's will has no power and no say. I heard, and I'll name a name, Jack Hibbs. Jack Hibbs is a marvelous preacher. He's a man, if you're a preacher and you're listening to another preacher, you're saying, man, this guy has got the chops. He's, he is so good you know, at speaking. And so, so I'm listening to him uh, on the radio and he's preaching about this and that and you've got to obey God, you know, it's important to obey God, you know, and I'm, I'm, that's right, amen, brother, keep preaching it, you know, and I'm driving along and I, I nearly went through a red light there. He says, uh, just as Acts 2.38 says, and I'm going, he's going to quote Acts 2.38. I've never heard an evangelical preacher ever quote Acts 2.38, never, never. And he says, as Acts 2.38 says, repent and have faith and you will be saved. Huh? <laughs> what? <laughs> we know that Acts 2.38 says, repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. But he quoted it. Now he had been quoted, he had been quoting Isaiah and Habakkuk, you know, just these uh, prophets off the top of his head. He was just going on and on. And then he got to old Acts 2.38. Everybody and their brother knows that passage. And he says, just as Acts 2.38 says, have faith, repent and have faith and you will be saved. I mean, he misquoted it because it didn't fit it didn't fit his evangelical mindset. <clears throat> so this brings us to the churches of Christ and how we are different. Not just that we don't use instruments or uh, we practice male spiritual leadership in our churches, these are different, but this is not the crucial difference. If I hear one more time, believe me if I hear it, tell me, you're here, please don't ever say this to me again. If I hear one more time somebody say, oh, the difference between us and our Baptist friends across the street, they use a piano and we don't, that's it. Everything else is the same. They, they actually excuse themselves from not attending worship with, church, with the church and instead go to an evangelical or a community church, you know, and they say, it's all the same. The only difference is, you know, they have a band, you know, but I mean, other than that, it's not a big deal. Boy, that is so wrong. It's so, so wrong. The important difference or advantages between us and them is that in our preaching of the gospel, Man's free will plays a crucial part in the process of salvation and does so because we believe that the Bible teaches that it does. That's the difference. Yes, Jesus died to pay the moral debt for sin for all men and yes, the Holy Spirit works to bring men face to face with the gospel, but in the end, each person must choose to believe and express that faith in obedience or not. Why? Because God made man in his image and one feature of the divine image is absolute free will. God's absolute free will led him to create mankind with the same absolute free will. This means that God created a being that had the power to reject him if he chose to do so. Because absolute free will enables you to say no to God. That's a scary thought, but true. And why did he do this? Why did God give man absolute free will, this like nuclear option. Why did he do that? 
He did that because this was the only way to bring into existence a being who could and would gen genuinely love God. Because without free will, it is not possible to love God or worship Him. You can't do it. On the other hand, God's absolute free will also permits Him to bless with eternal life those who choose to believe in Him and reject those who reject Him. You see, free will cuts both ways. Now, lest we leave here thinking everybody else is wrong and we are right, because that's not so. I want to point out a serious mistake that we in the Church of Christ make in our proclamation of the gospel, and I mentioned it in my class. In simple terms, we preach the response to the gospel as the gospel itself. Here's what I mean by this. When you ask someone in the church of Christ, what is the plan of salvation? They'll answer you, oh, the answer you get is the five step plan of salvation. Hear the gospel, believe the gospel, confess, repent, be baptized. That's the plan of salvation. I have seen this plan of salvation on billboards, tracks. I've heard countless sermons and soul winning seminars promote these five steps as God's plan to save man. No wonder we're often accused of legalism. This is not the plan of salvation. This is man's response to God's plan of salvation. These are expressions of faith. The plan of salvation is that God the Father sent God the Son to make uh, uh, and to offer his life to pay for the moral price for man's sin. The plan to save man was called vicarious atonement, a scripture. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished on us, there's God's free will saving us. And then in Romans five, for while we were still helpless, the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man, someone would dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Brothers and sisters, this is the plan of salvation. While we were sinners, while we were helpless, God sent his son to take our place, to take the punishment for sins from us. Brothers and sisters, as I said, this is the plan. This is the gospel. This is the good news. Now, once we believe as true this good news, our response of faith is to repent of our sins and confess Christ and be baptized, Acts 2.38. You see, there's no good news in confessing Jesus or repenting or being baptized. Uh, you could convince me that I have to do this, but there's no glad tidings here. These are things to do. This is legalism in, in its purest form. You know, do this and you get that. The change we have to make is that we need to preach the gospel. Jesus died for your sins so you don't have to suffer condemnation and death for your spirit. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's good news for me personally because I'm a sinner. What do I do now? You know, for those of you who have had abortions, I won't ask for names. But for those of you who have had abortions, for those of you who have paid someone to have an abortion, yeah, exactly how are you going to fix that? Exactly how are you going to repent from that? Exactly what are you going to do to make that right? Those of you who have cheated on your spouses, how are you going to fix that? How are you going to make that right? Those of you who have lied uh, to your children, 
about what you have done and who you are. How are you going to fix that? How are you going to go back and make that right? But you're not, you can't. What's the good news? The good news is that by his death on the cross, Jesus eliminates the punishment for that abortion you had, for that adultery you had, for that divorce you had, for that murder you did, for that whatever you did. His death on the cross wipes it away forever and allows you to come before God as a clean and righteous being. That's the good news. I want to hear that news because if somebody tells me that news, right, I'm going to say, wonderful, what do I do now? Oh, okay. Well, if you believe that good news, then repent and be baptized. Now it all makes sense to me. Now it all makes sense. So let's remember, first, let's make sure we preach the gospel message because it's the power of God unto salvation. It's what pierces the heart. It's what makes people want to respond to God. And then second, then let's explain the response of faith because repentance and baptism have been the proper biblical response of obedient faith, beginning with John the Baptist through Jesus and his apostles to this very day and to the very end of the world when Jesus will return. The 10 examples of believers being baptized in the book of Acts trumps any arguments that baptism is not important for salvation. Anybody says to you, you know, baptism is not really important, not really necessary. You tell them, well, how come there are 10 examples of it in the book of Acts alone? Sinners who have learned the gospel immediately are baptized. When God tells you one thing, one time, it's, a, it's enough one time. But if he tells you twice, oh, you better pay attention. If he tells you three times, then you know, he's really serious. But if he tells you 10 times, you know, in Jewish numerology, 10 is the perfect number. It's the mature number. It can't get any better. If he tells you the same thing 10 times, then you can be absolutely positive about what you are to do or what you need to do. So very quickly, why go? Why organize local evangelism? Why send a missionary? Why spend the money to send others? Why remind everybody on the regular basis that mission work is important? It's worth the time. The answer, why go? Three main reasons. God strongly commands it. It's hard to read the New Testament and not notice that it's important to preach the gospel. Number two, the world is lost and will suffer because of it. It's good to help the poor and the sick and those with no voice, but saving a soul is more important in the scheme of things. Both rich and poor have the same time on this earth and both of them die. Their souls, however, are eternal and mission work deals with the eternal life or death and the outcome. What does the Bible say? In Romans 3.23, all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. In Romans 6, 23, the wage of sin is death. We need to remember that. And then finally, the Bible has the answer, but the world has corrupted even that in most instances. If we're, to, if we're so sure that we have the truth correctly discerned, then it's a sin if we don't proclaim it far and wide. And so once we answer the question, why go? We each as Christians and collectively as the church must answer the question, who will go? And I invite this congregation to seek out those who will say, here I am, Lord, send me. Are you one of those? The Lord pulling on you to give him the answer, here I am, Lord, send me. 
Are you saying to you, but I'm, I'm just a young person. What, what could I do? The Lord calls the young and the old to do his will. And so I close out this lesson by asking those who have not yet decided to obey the gospel and to exercise your free will this morning by choosing to express your faith in Jesus Christ by repenting of your sins and being immersed in water. That's what baptism is. And to do so without further delay. Like I said, in the book of Acts alone, there are 10 examples of people doing it. You simply are following what the Bible says. And so if you need to respond to the invitation this morning, the invitation being A, get involved in mission work and B, obey the gospel by repenting in baptism, then I encourage you to come forward now as we stand and as we sing our song of encouragement.